And hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Wagner, and welcome to the .NET Managed Languages and Runtime Community Stand-Up. I, I am wicked excited about today's show, being on the East Coast um, of the United States. So, uh, again, to introduce myself, I'm Bill Wagner. I am responsible for the C-Sharp Docs on Learn. With me, going around the circle here, is uh, Kathleen Dollard. Uh, .NET Languages PM for C Sharp, F Sharp, and VB. Uh, Chad Husk, uh, .NET SDK PM, and he'll be monitoring chat among uh, other things today. And our guest today is Michaela Hutchison. She is an architect on the .NET uh, PM team. And what we're talking about today is trying to simplify the whole development experience for .NET developers. You know we've been around. .NET can do so many different things, everything from its history in Xamarin and Mono and Mac, iOS, Android, even Windows. Um, I've heard we support, you know, ASP.NET and all these different workloads. There's a lot of different variables and, and things to make our environments work the way we want. So Michaela is here to kind of help drive. How, how do we make this simpler? You know, if I'm new to .NET, what do I do? Yeah, that's a very open-ended question. Um, there's multiple different kind of angles we can look at that from. Um, there are, of course, the users, the developers who are new to .NET, and all the new concepts can be kind of overwhelming when you create your first C-sharp project. You, end, you have to be faced with the csproj file and all of the XML in that, which we'll get to, to later. Um, and then there's things beyond that, like we can look at the process of publishing, of managing your SDK. Like there's all of these different facets of the experience. Um, and then the other angle we can look at this from is um, we have a lot of, of, of existing developers and naturally, the experience has a tendency to grow more complex over time. Like every new release, we add new features, we add new functionality, we add new concepts. And so it naturally grows over time. And so this is an effort to push back against that and try and reduce the complexity back down. And obviously, we can't get, a, get rid of complexity entirely if it's still there you're going you're going to run into things at some point but but at least defer that complexity until you get to a point where it's actually relevant and necessary to what you're doing i i really like the way you phrase that because as, as you were starting to speak i'm going well are you going to start removing options from me or taking away some of the things that i might need and it sounds like what you're really doing here is making it so unless there's stuff I need that's special to what I'm doing. It's not in my face. It's not something I have to make a decision about. I can accept good defaults and a, and a, a simpler default experience. And then if I need to, you know, I can peel back the covers and find the knobs that I need for something I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like to think of it as an on-ramp. Um, it, it, sort of, we don't want it that you start your .NET development experience right on the freeway in 60 mile an hour traffic with cars all around you that, you know, we want you to be able to start slow and then have like a nice smooth ramp as you like gradually get your speed up and accelerate and you don't just suddenly have a moment where you're faced with a whole lot of things at, at the same time. Um, the nice comment. Progressive disclosure. Is that how you describe it? Yes, that, that is definitely a relevant term um, here. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I like to think in terms of metaphors. The kind of inverse to the on-ramp is the cliff. Like you don't want people to suddenly, like a nice smooth development experience, and then they suddenly drop off a cliff where they suddenly have to deal with a whole load of problems all at once. We want to make yeah. that journey nice and smooth. I always thought of that as you were going along a trail and encountered a cliff you had to climb, not uh, that you were going along and fell off a cliff. So I, I, yeah. 
Yeah, it works. It works both ways. Yeah, it's like the cliff. You suddenly have to work really hard to climb, le learn how to climb, learn ropes, learn how to like hammer things into the rock face and so on. Or the other way, you fall off a cliff and it's a catastrophe. It's a disaster. You suddenly run into problems you cannot deal with and you have to fix them. Yeah. I do really like the cliff so, so because you can uh, get up a cliff or, or scale mm -hmm. a cliff, right? But you need tools to help you get there. Mm -hmm. And that I think is an area where .NET generally tries to shine, right? It's not just mm -hmm. a feature set. It's just not the language. It's the way the language and the feature set of the tooling come together. And so, mm -hmm. Michaela, as you've been uh, dwelling on the simplicity of our stack, like how the tooling can help you has been a key discussion point the entire time. And I'm excited to talk about that more too. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is something, of course, that we have been doing for years all, all over our stack, all over our ecosystem. Um, it's something that we're always aware of and trying to um, trying to make sure that the journey is smooth, trying to make sure that you aren't faced with unnecessary complexity at a time you don't need it. Um, but uh, yeah, this current initiative that we're taking is is kind of taking a step back and looking at the whole thing end to end, like from your start as a new .NET developer or someone who's stepping into working on a large existing project all the way through to deploying that. What are all of the, all of the bumps along the way, um, all of the places where things aren't progressively disclosed? Um, and how do we make sure that we have this 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 vision of what the full .NET developer journey should look like from start to to finish? I'm not that there is a finish, hopefully, but um, yeah. yeah. And we just announced something that we didn't know we'd be able to talk about today, which is for Visual Studio uh, users, the uh, SLNX file oh. format has now been released. For those of you that have not seen it. You can probably look that up. There's a couple of good videos on it. But basically, we're looking at the solution file and making it store better to help it primarily to help your uh, Git experience, where when you do a Git diff, it'll make sense instead of being the mess that it has been uh, for quite a while. So, yeah. Awesome. So, you know, and I look at this like, so today, I think where you're focusing, Michael, it's more on the SDK and, and the tools, you know, because I can see this also like uh, some of the things that have been added in C Sharp and the language, you know, like top level statements means when you're a new developer, mm -hmm. you know, you don't need to know all these namespaces yet because we've got implicit usings mm -hmm. and you don't need class program static void main. It's just my statements. And then as you add functionality, all of that is there and you slowly you start to realize what you're using and what you need. Um, so where should we start looking into this? Like, what what are we doing? What what am I going to get excited about in uh, in the tooling here? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of different ideas that 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 we've had from from making it so that you can do do away with project files entirely if you don't need them. Um, like, if you have a new project where the content of your project are completely kind of irrelevant. They're just what you would get from a new template and you haven't touched your project file at all, then why do you need a project file? And this discussion has been happening for some years now. Like, why can't I do .NET run foo.cs and just run my C-sharp file directly without a project file? So that's that's one example of, of one of the things we're looking at. Um, you can apply that that rationale to solution files as well. Like with the new solution uh, file format, um, now that we're actually looking at, cha at changing this from something very opaque and difficult to understand into something where you can actually understand what it says so that your merges and, and your diffs and so on are meaningful, um, there's an opportunity for further development along um, in that. So perhaps at some point we could add globs and then if your solution file is always just uh, star star slash star dot csproj, 
then your solution file becomes kind of meaningless if it if every solution file just looks like the default solution file. Why do you need a, a solution file? Um, so these are kind of examples of, of of the kinds of things we are looking at. Um, there is one there is one uh, particular idea that I'm quite excited about uh, that has the uh, working title of versioned project archetypes. Um, that's not what I would expect it to be called. Um, throwing in a, I'm I'm hoping it's going to be simple projects. That's what I'm hoping we'll have as a name uh, once we go out with it. But version project archetypes will help you understand what it's all about. Yes, it doesn't sound simple though. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, and and honestly, the reason I picked the name archetypes is because we have so much. Um, we have so much confusion between terms that are very similar or identical but mean different things. Like we talk about an SDK today, but is that the .NET SDK that you install, or is it an MS Build SDK, for example? Like these are completely different things, but we call them both SDKs. Um, and so, as we were developing this concept, I just wanted to have a term that was distinct and unique so that we didn't have any kind of ambiguity or confusion <laughs> with these overloaded overloaded terms. Um, yeah, so so uh, yeah, the elevator pitch for for version project ar archetypes um, is 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 fairly straight straightforward. Um, the the there are kind of two different angles um, I came at this from. Um, one was looking at how over time so one of it was let's make projects as simple as possible for new de for new developers that's one aspect um the other side was if you look at a dotnet project file today your file your your dotnet new console um is almost twice the length that as it was in dotnet 2.1 and there is there is a very good reason for that, which is that we have we have new features, new settings that we would like to enable by default because they they result in what we consider to be a better experience, like like uh, like nullable implicit mm -hmm. usings. Um, yep. We cannot enable those by default um, in the SDK itself because they would cause breaking changes for existing projects. It would mean if you took a project and then updated your SDK and then did .NET build again, it would break. Um, so we can't, we can't, we cannot make it. So a, pr a project without anything that says whether nullability should be turned on, uh, on or off is on because that would just break all of the existing. Right. Projects and so we have these kind of like two big examples that if you look in every new project you get today, it's nullable and implicit usings. There are a couple of others coming down the line um, that uh, I'm not sure if we can get into here, but um, yeah. And there are examples of things where in the past we've kind of tied things to um, your target framework. So the default value of some properties depends on your target framework, but that causes problems for multi-targeting because now when you multi-target, all of your inner builds will actually have different settings. So you get inconsistent inner builds and then you end up having to set a whole bunch of properties right. and figure out what they are to, to get consistent inner builds. Um, and there are other things that we would have liked to turn on by default. Um, like things like the artifacts directory or or um, or central package management, for example, which I think both of those should be on by default for for new sol sol solutions. But those are more examples of the kinds of things that we just couldn't turn on by default because they would have had at least a high risk of breaking mm -hmm. um, some some projects out there. Right, and even things like you know yeah. and the TFM ties to your language version in C mm -hmm. sharp because of you know each language version relies on something in the runtime mm -hmm. or um, something in the CLR that may have changed, and once you start getting out of that, it kind of things can get ugly fast. But um, yeah, 
that's a little bit more of a gray area. Like I, I do, I have several projects I maintain which multi-target mm -hmm. um, to older, uh, to older framework versions because I want the library to be able to be consumed by people mm -hmm. on those older versions. And yet I want to be able to use newer language features in my code I'm writing. And some of the features, some of the newer C sharp features don't depend on on, right. on runtime or framework features. And some of them depend that depend on types or attributes existing. You can just redefine those types or attributes mm -hmm. conditionally in your own code. So it is possible. Like it's not supported, but it is possible to use certain C sharp versions down level. And I think probably the vast majority of of people using multi-targeting end up doing that anyway. But it is more more difficult than it needs to be. Um, yeah. So our solution to this um, to this problem of these settings we can't change, um, the defaults has been to make our templates opt into them. So every time you create a new project, your project has the has has the has a good recommended defaults but we don't change the behaviors of existing projects um, and that has the downsides that your project fi the file new project dot net new mm -hmm. project um, has grown in size and complexity like there's no reason that someone new to c sharp has to actually understand that um, that there are projects where in, where there aren't implicit usings and there isn't reference nullability. Um, right. So when they open their csproj file, they suddenly have these two concepts that, that they have to understand why those elements are there or just ignore them and treat them as this kind of like mysterious magic thing that they don't want to dig into there and then. Um, but it's unnecessary complex complexity that makes it feel more complex than it needs to. Um, and so this seems backwards to me that if you are if you are on the very if you're creating a brand new project or you've updated your project to use the best recommended settings, your project file is more complex than people who are remaining on older settings. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so this is a problem that applies to projects today. It also is something that is just going to grow over time as we add more of these settings. Like we already have, have a couple more we're, we're planning to. I'm sure there will be more down the line. And so this is a problem. We need a, we need a mechanism to handle this so that um, we can get our .NET new down to the nice short project it used to be um, and make sure that it doesn't grow again uh, that sounds super cool so uh, so i'm just thinking how 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 are we going to make this happen mm -hmm. yeah so i have a demo to show you here of one uh yeah is that yep i gotta add that right there we go okay uh yeah so i built a quick prototype of these uh, versioned project archetypes. So if we look here, I, I can just show you uh, um, what I was talking about before. Like this is what a new uh, console app looked like for .NET Core 2.1. Nice and simple, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's just you have a few concepts here. You have the concept, it's a project. It references an SDK. It sets the output type, and it sets the target framework. So there's basically four concepts here. Um, but if we go up to what a new project today looks like, uh, this is going to be, oops, nope, that was, <laughs> oops, my demo. That's what it looks like today. Um, well, ignore the root namespace. That was because when I created this project originally, it had a dash in it, and then that gets turned into an underscore. That's something I think we should also fix in that we could just do that in the build targets. It doesn't need to be in your project file. Um, but yeah, so you have your, it's a project. It references an SDK. It has an output type and a target framework, same as before. But you've also got implicit usings and 
nullable. So you've gone from four concepts to six concepts um, just in your um, new console. And if we go up to what uh, to what you have with uh, version project archetypes, this is what that new console app looks with version looks like with versioned project archetypes. So the idea here is that you have a sort of base project that your project inherits from just like um, just like a class inheritance um, in that your project doesn't have to de define all these things you inherit from a base project that defines them and you can override them you can have a property group that sets the target framework to something else or or whatever but you get those from your base project. Um, and so this would allow us to have more specialized space projects like console, um, as well as .NET, library, Aspire, and so on. So, so your, your default project for each of those common types um, just becomes essentially empty, which means that any settings you change in project options or anything that happens as a result of you running um, a command like a package add command on the CLI, which might change your project file. Those changes that happen, it means your project file is only going to reflect those changes that you have made, those changes that are relevant. It do doesn't just contain this, what's essentially boilerplate, like what do I need for a console app? Um, and you can see here that this, um, you might ask why it's SDK equals inherits colon. And the reason here is because I built this prototype without actually modifying uh, MS build itself. Um, so this uses a mechanism known as MS build uh, SDK is the uh, modern um, project format, also known as SDK style. Uh, it has this SDK attribute, which what this essentially means is go and find the SDK with this name and then import the props file from the sdk.props from the sdk at the top of the project and import the sdk.targets file from the sdk at the bottom of the project. So if you have your sdk equals microsoft.net.sdk, there is a microsoft.net.sdk MS build sdk that this then means goes go and find it, um, go and find the sdk.props and sdk.targets from that. So, so this sdk attribute is essentially syntactic sugar over import MS build props and targets for my build build logic. Um, and we're, we're but, getting a ton of questions when you're ready, Michaela, we can, uh, yeah. I'll let Chet manage those. We've got a whole bunch. We have nine of them started right now. I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but uh, is this a good time or do you want to go a little further before we uh, take them? Yeah, yeah, let's take them now. Um, it, it's, def it's definitely possible I might answer some of these questions anyway as I get later in. Into my demo, but, uh, I think we might, yeah. Um, there are some buckets around, like I, I would organize this into three sort of buckets. Uh -huh. Questions around some of the topics we were touching on before we started talking about the simplification features. Questions about how we think about some of the features that are shipped in the default templates today. Uh -huh. uh, and then finally, questions about the proposal that you have just shown that uh, I think that you will cover as we continue discussing it. So let's just try and knock some of these out real quick. Okay. Very early on, uh, Manstuff asked, what's a PM? Uh, Kathleen and I are PMs in the product manager sense. We own mm -hmm. areas of the, the .NET product, and our responsibility is to do user studies and know the feature set of our products and try and work with our engineering teams to develop and prioritize the roadmaps and that deliver the features that you all need in the right order. Right? The Kathleen, way I like to push. think about it, the way I like to think about it is engineering builds the product right and we help build the right product. And so we guide that user studies are just a tool. This the, yeah. we have tools that we use. But at the end of the day, uh, we we guide product. So yep. yeah that's and then Michaela is on the same team and has the same uh, title, but she's an architect. So she has um, a little bit different role in terms of guiding the shape um, of what we're building. 
Uh, Mads Torgerson is another architect. So yeah. All right. So what's next? We've got a couple um, about this, the SLNX uh, file. The first was about, here, I guess we can show these, um, build debug configurations in that file. So there aren't a lot of details about the implementation of that proposal that are sort of public knowledge yet. I will just say that this information is still there, but just like we did with the uh, project files early in .NET Core, we've applied defaults, right? So if something is absent, you can infer that, that some default has been added there. Like everything else we do, there are escape patches and there are knobs that you can use to provide those if you need to override or customize them. Mm -hmm. Again, look for more details and more communication about the SLNX file, support uh, in the .NET CLI and the broader sort of tooling ecosystem in the coming weeks. And, and yeah, just keep an eye out there. Yeah, we have this we have this mechanism at the solution level where you have this concept of a solution configuration that then maps to project configurations. And so when you build the solution con configuration, it builds each project in the mapped project configuration. And for the vast majority of solutions out there, it's just the a solution has a debug configuration and a release configuration, and the debug configuration maps to the debug config. The debug solution configuration maps to the de debug configuration of every single project, and the and release the same. So they are very symmetrical in that way. And so, if we understand that that's what the vast majority of people want, and the file only shows what's different from that, then we can basically treat that as implicit. And I know it, it is possible to do much more complex things with solution configurations, but most people don't. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, the next one is, I think, uh, one that Kathleen can field for us. Are there any plans to be able to modify sources instead of only adding them with source generators? No. <laughs> I mean, All right. I'm sorry. It's 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 out of the it's out of this the scope and the design of what we're doing. Um, we do have the interceptors in preview right now. We're looking at how that moves forward, which doesn't actually change your code, but it does give you more flexibility in, in what code gets called. So in place, you can change what code is called. So that's I'm not going to go any deeper into that right now, but to actually change code, uh, we believe that what a programmer wrote is what they wrote, and that going in and messing with it may not be the best idea. Mm -hmm. So that's overall the answer to that. And I, can I add one thing on that one? So, so one hallmark of C Sharp as a language is that one of the things that we've always tried to do is if you read C Sharp and you just look at the source, you should be able to reason about what that program does. Now, there's a few odd escape patches, like whether nullable is turned on or implicit usings. So there's a few things that we br we break out of that. But in general... If you see source, you should be able to reason about what it does. If the build system could modify the source, that's a really huge escape hatch. So there's there's some good reasons to go. I don't really think we want to go there. Cool. Uh, we've got a couple more about uh, sort of features in general. Um, Roos Mermaid said we need more functional programming in C Sharp. Yes, and we do. <laughs> and for that, I would say you have a spectrum of opportunities available to you on the .NET platform, right? You've got features like collection and collection expressions and uh, more improvements in pattern matching in C Sharp that come release after release. You've got external libraries like OneOf and Language EXT if you want things like exhaustive matching today that you can explore. And then if you are language curious, there's an entirely supported language on the .NET platform that you can use called F Sharp that is functional first, but can integrate with your existing C Sharp code. Did I do that right, Kathleen? <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah, these are all my babies. So uh, yes, and we'll talk about F Sharp again here soon, but we think about function functional programming as we think about developing C Sharp, but since it's underlying an object-oriented language without the type inference that F Sharp has, then we, there's certain things that we, we, we have to work hard to make it uh, performant and not ugly. And so something like discriminated unions, which we have been putting effort into, um, are challenging. And, and we'll, we'll hopefully have some stuff to show publicly uh, in this venue in a, in a month or two. 
because um, we are definitely moving forward on that one. So yes, we want to, but it's going to be very, um, it's going to be very progressive and slow uh, because we're just going to add the feature that makes sense for C sharp, not features just because they're functional. And so we'll leave that to F sharp if you want a full functional language. All right, we had a bunch of questions and I just added them as fast as we're knocking them down, Chet. So we may have to, I don't know what we're gonna work out oh, here. We're getting through them. So these are the ones that I think are starting to relate to our topic today, right? So Stuart has um, a future facing wish saying, I wish that we could use something mm -hmm. like KDL as an optional project syntax. And then the MS build preprocessor would just deal with it. So you'd have a prettier format for project files. And so for those who don't know, um, about the MS build preprocessor, this is something that Michaela was talking about a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. When you build a solution file, you're not actually building a solution file. MS build has some logic that transforms that solution file into an MS build project under the covers and then invokes that synthesized project. You could theoretically have uh, a number of different um, file formats for a project file. You could do TOML, you could do INI, you could do an in-memory data structure if you wanted to. But where these front matters get uh, complex is that you don't have tooling support with those things, right? Like the project system in VS or DevKit isn't going to understand those. And uh, you actually see this with alternative build engines like Basil today. When you want to integrate .NET into those systems, you have to recreate everything from hand. There's not really a good mechanism for having something that looks like MS Build that works in these other systems. So it's not the format that I think is the hard part. It's the integration with all of the rest of the tooling. Michaela, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, um, it's funny you should mention that. I do actually have a fully fleshed out proposal for um, ha for uh, using either YAML or JSON um, as an alternate syntax for MS build files that would be um, the same model, um, so the same project model, same build engine, um, simply a different way of representing your CSproj file um, that would be one-to-one -one transfer uh, transformable to and from the existing XML format. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it, um, as Chad said, it is it is a lot more, it is a lot more difficult to do than you might expect in that, you know, I could build a little CLI tool that lets you switch them back and forth quite easily, you know, probably a day or two, no big deal. But having every single tool out there in the ecosystem that touches project files able to now understand that there's two different syntaxes of project file and it has to put them through a transformation um, is just an incredibly uh, an incredibly disruptive thing to do so you know it, it's it's there on 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 the board of ideas of things that we're considering to simplify things but but the bang for the buck um, like the, the the benefit that we would get in exchange for the amount of work it would cost it's just not not that great compared to to the other things we could do. And one final note on that is that it's there are two kind of sides to a project file. There's the declarative side where you say, here are my properties, here are my target frameworks, here are the files, here are the package references, here are the project references. But the project file is very often customized by people as well, inserting their own targets. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to model those declarative portions in other languages or ecosystems, it is much more difficult to accurately model the programmatic parts of the project file as well. So if we did some sort of split right there, we would either have to say, we would either have to like have a clear split and say all the declarative things go in this format and you have to put your XML, your build logic in a separate file, or we would need to commit to recreating a whole bunch of MS build syntax in whatever the new format is, right? So there's not really an excellent trade-off there, in my opinion. Yeah, my uh, my proposal that I wrote is essentially um, scoped it so that you would be able to represent project files in, in YAML or JSON um, and 
not just the trivial ones either, like it also had a syntax for conditions and 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 so on. But you, you would reach a point where it like if you wanted custom targets where that would just not be within the scope of this alternate format and you'd have to switch over to the XML format. Okay, so we're getting through a lot of the I would say the miscellaneous questions, but now we're coming into the ones that relate to the topic here. So there are two back to back here um, that we're talking about the same thing. DE said, if it's not a desired way forward, why release it? Meaning these properties that we insert into the templates as kind of a safe default. And Michael Bond had some opinions about some of those as well saying, I think it's been long enough that nullable and implicit usings can just be defaulted to on. Why don't we do that? Can you go into detail about why we sort of have this uh, position of compatibility over feature? I, I can take that. Uh, yeah. uh, we don't want to break people. We have a lot. There's a lot of applications out in the, in the wild. And we don't want somebody to uh, recompile with a new uh, version of the SDK, a, a new TFM. And all of a sudden, they're broken. Um, nullable was the uh, was the feature that had the potential to launch a trillion uh, warning messages. Um, it, it is it is an absolutely enormous hit on your project for anyone who, know, who has tried to convert a project from not nullable to, to nullable supported. And also, we had scenarios where we believed that there was I can't remember if it's a likelihood, a possibility, but global usings uh, causing different code to run. We would consider that a breaking change. So um, these, this was done because it was too disruptive or a breaking change that was unnecessary to take. We will continue to have that attitude. We, we, we value running code at an enormously high level and we'll continue to do so. Yeah, yeah. I'll I was gonna add one addendum there is that we, we also know a lot of people are running with warnings as errors in their builds. So instead of just getting new output, it would literally stop. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we have this tension between you know we don't want to break people, but we do want to change the way that things are done in mainstream C sharp uh, going forward, and that's always a tension of how do you how do you actually give people a path to move forwards as as well. And we do have things like the migration assistant now that that help with that. But um, but yeah, one one of the things that we're considering as part of this whole simplification effort is not just how not just how do we simplify things for new developers, but how do we help existing developers move forwards onto the new ways of doing things mm -hmm. as well. Um, right now, you can use the migration assistant, and it, it'll do some of this for you. But for a lot of things, you're kind of on your own to go and look in the, look in the docs and figure out what things have now changed, what things are new, what things are different, what's the current recommended way of doing things, and what changes you need to make to your project for it to be um, uh, for it to be doing things the 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 current recommended way. That is a perfect segue to the next question, Michaela. You could not have lined that up any better because Michael Bond immediately after seeing the uh, the look of the new project file with the inherits mm -hmm. and the SDK said, this seems similar to having a build props file. Do you want to like dive into why we're exploring this direction instead of like a build props in your root and this kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And Kathleen, you can't say because you hate the name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So um, yeah, so let's, let's get back to the demo. Um, yeah, so uh so uh yeah, so this is our new simple project. No, um, wait, wrong way. Let me get the right one in here. There we go. Be back. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So uh so yeah, th this is our new simple project format and just imagine for the sake of argument that it's actually project inherits equals console dash nine oh you you don't have that that SDK equals um but that would require MS build engine changes, which I didn't uh, make for my prototype. Uh, what I built for this prototype was essentially uh, something called an MS build SDK resolver, which lets you basically control like what SDK props and targets 
um, M MS build finds when it tries to resolve and load this SDK. So I built a custom re re resolver that goes and resolves SDKs from a different location, which has these versioned archetypes. And so the versioning is a key part of this. Um, so part of it is that you have your console, your Aspire, your, um, your library, and so on that enable your projects to be simpler, right? Your, your console um, project doesn't no longer needs um, an output type XE because that's implied by, uh, by the base console. Um, uh, archetype that you're in, in, inheriting from. The other part is that it is versioned. So here with, we're inheriting from console 9.0. Now in .NET 10, you would then have a console 10.0, .NET 11, console 11.0, and so on. And because it is versioned, that means that we can now also make the target framework um, implied by that. So this, so the base console 9.0 would set the target framework to net 9.0. The console dash 10.0 would set tar tar target framework to net 10.0. And we would ship the uh, older versions of the archetypes with newer SDKs. So when you install the .NET 10 SDK um, and build this project that uses the 9.0 archetype, you would still get the, uh, the, the settings from the 9.0 archetype, not the settings from the 10.0 archetype. So, so that means that we that's how we solve the breaking changes issue. And if your project is using the, the 9.0 archetype, you can build on a newer SDK. You don't have to change your archetype at all. You don't change your project in the slightest, and you still get the exact same build behaviors, um, whereas people who create a new project on .NET 10.0 Will get um, may get different um, different uh, property settings from from that from the Tenno version of the archetype that have newer recommended settings. Like the target framework is just one, but if we were to introduce something like nullable or implicit usings or so on again, then the archetype from that version onwards could then turn that feature on. And it wouldn't have to be turned on in your project file. It would be turned on in the newer archetype. Um, and we're, a little later in the demo, we'll get to how do you move your project onto the newer archetypes? Like if you're on a 9.0 archetype, how do you move forwards to a 10.0 archetype without breaking things? Um, Michaela, there's one question in the chat that I think that's relevant here. Um, so Michael, as you were walking through that, said this is starting to make sense to me. Hopefully, there's a way to see what these uh, default props values are. Can you talk to that a bit? Yes. So, um, so uh, yeah. So if we uh, just demonstrate that this this is actually a so this demo is actually fully functional in that. I can actually build this and it will take a second. This, so this .NET archetype is basically a wrapper around .NET that injects my SDK re resolver in. So you can pass all of the thing, all of the verbs that you have for .NET, you can pass to this. So that's what that dot, .NET archetype is. So you can see that um, with my uh, custom resolver in chat, Injected in this this simplified project does does in fact build, but uh, yeah, what are the props and 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 targets for that? So that we can look in uh, this uh, and, and and also if we go forward with this, there's likely to be tooling. We hope to have an F12 tooling. So that you can just do a go to definition and see it that way too. Yes. Uh, in fact, today you can have that if you install the MS Build editor in Visual Studio on on Windows. Uh, you can um, you can uh, F12 go to, to definition on um, on the SDK uh, 
va value in a product file, and it'll let you navigate to the SDK props and targets for that. So if any of the folks watching have not tried installing that editor yet, um, I would recommend it. It's an it's an experiment we're running at the moment. Um, that's also something that I that I wrote, and we're looking at um, gathering feedback so we can hopefully make it a default part of the experience. But um, yeah, any feedback folks have on that, um, it's a massive improvement for the experience of editing MS build files, and it does have that go to definition on the SDK attribute. Um, that would actually make this demo much easier on <laughs> on Windows, but um, I'm doing it on I'm doing it on a Mac because I like to switch back and forth between the two to try and make sure that we have good a good experience both on Windows and not on Windows. Um, so yeah, so this demo this demo I'm doing on Mac. But uh, yeah, so the archetypes re resolver resolves archetypes from this di directory here. So if we go and look in the in the uh, console archetype. We see that we have a 9.0 there because it's versioned. And then here we have, so we have our SDK.props and SDK.targets, as you would expect from any SDK, from any MS build SDK. Then we also have this archetype.props and archetype.targets, which are things specific to archetype um, SDKs. These archetypes are essentially just a pattern for MS build SDKs. It doesn't actually require any new MS build functionality at all. Um, it is just a, a pattern. Um, but uh, yeah, so if, if we go and look in this uh, SDK.props, we will see that what this actually does, the so the SDK.props in, in this archetype mechanism, the SDK.props and SDK.targets are auto-generated. And so what this does here is it imports the SDK props from the Microsoft.NET SDK. Um, it imports the archetype props from the .NET archetype, um, which is where we do the the which is the, basically the base class of this. Um, so console inherits from .NET. So the settings that are common to all .NET projects in newer SDK versions, we can just put in the .NET archetype instead of putting it in all these more specific derived archetypes. Um, so it imports the archetype.props from, um, from the base archetype, and then it imports its own archetype props. Um, so this, yeah, so this SDK props file is auto-generated to make sure that it just follows the pattern exactly. Um, and the SDK.targets file is basically the same thing in inverse um, because that's that's how the ordering would be expected to uh, to go um, so you you have the archetypes targets the base archetypes targets and then the S sdk targets um, and the way that is auto generated is that we also have this manifest file which is uh yeah just a time check we have um, we have about eight minutes. We're likely to run over a bit today, and I don't want us to miss the versioning stuff because that's the that's the coolest. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah. So the arc, so the archetype just defines the inheritance, so the tooling can um, can handle the auto generation, um, and also for the upgrade stuff that we'll get to later. But uh, yeah. So if we look in the archetype props, uh, this is basically whether the archetype itself is defined. So we have, so the console archetype sets output type to XE, and the console uh, archetype targets does nothing. Um, but if we look in the uh, .NET, archetype props, we then see that this sets the target framework. Uh, this should actually be net 9.0, but on this machine, I didn't have 9.0 installed. So for the sake of making it work, it's 8.0. But imagine that says net 9.0, not 8.0. Um, but yeah, so this so this enables all of the settings that this archetype is enabling. Um, uh, yeah, and then the archetype targets can potentially do interesting things. Like this here uh, means that you get much, it, this is a little bit of logic, which means that you get good settings for 
nullable that allow you to multi-target um, uh, and have turning nullability on by default when multi-targeting actually results in good behavior with, with, with this. Yeah, so that's your base .NET archetype. And then you have your, your more derived archetypes. Um, and as you saw here, you can have your library, your web, your Aspire, and so on, which would mean that all of those projects now become very simple. And your project file only reflects the changes specific to your project, not specific to that kind of project. Uh, yeah, so how do you switch? How do you go from an archetype to a newer version of the archetype? This this um, this is also something that 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 we've been considering as part of the uh, simplification story. Is how do we how do we make sure that we don't leave people behind on older versions, older settings, um, dealing with more complexity than they need to when we've reduced the com the complexity in newer versions. So here we have an example. So here we have our example of console, uh, unmigrated console app uh, as of .NET 80. So what happens if I run? So I implemented a new verb, which is very um, yes. It, it's 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 not fully implemented at this point. Um, so this is something I I need to finish before sharing this this prototype more broadly. But uh, what happens if I want to take this unmigrated project and migrate it to the 9.0 archetype? So I can run this migrate tool, um, which would be a new verb on .NET, .NET migrate. Maybe it wouldn't be called migrate. This is just a, a prototype. Um, but I, I, I run this, it migrates it. And then if we look in that file, we now have that this, this uses the console 9 archetype. And then it adds a property group here with a label. You can put labels on any pr pr property group in MS Build. They're purely cosmetic. Almost no one uses them, but I figured it made sense to use them here because this, 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 this is a group of properties with a very specific purpose. Um, and it's explained in the comment. What this means is that the build behavior of this project has not changed at all. The migrate didn't change how the project built. It didn't change any of the defaults. What it did was move it forward to the new archetype and then overrode the settings that had changed in the archetype back to the settings it had before. So you can now look at these individual properties that are essentially the diff between your project and the newer archetype you've migrated onto. And you can review these individually and delete them. And in some cases, if one of these, this project had nullability enabled, so this didn't need to, disa to disable nullability. But if you'd migrated a project that didn't use nullability, then this property group would also contain nullable disable. And so, that you wouldn't, you can just delete that and have everything be fine. So these properties, you get the opportunity to see what has changed between where you were and where new projects are at today and review those and decide if you want the newer value of that setting or not and individually review um, and, and, and delete those and reviewing and deleting those might involve making some changes to your code. It, if it's something with more impact, like null, null ability or implicit usings. So Michaela, there's a couple comments in chat that I think are relevant to what we're showing right now. First <laughs> off, for John Galloway, we've got your regions right here. You can slap a label on a property group and go to town, my friend. Uh, but secondly, um, Stuart Lang mentioned in chat, it seems like a lot of this you could do today if you were like, deeply knowledgeable enough to create your own SDK. Um, so the big thing with this prototype is inheritance, right? Mm -hmm. I see that it's like half true. The other part that you just showed that is the real win to me is the automated controlling of migration. Instead of it being a one-off activity, it's now a multi-phase 
activity that you as the developer are in control of and have tooling to help you adjust. Is that correct? Is that yes. off base? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yeah. A developer today could create their own SDKs. Like you can even put SDKs on NuGet. You don't you don't get a great tool, tooling experience for that, but like you could create an archetype SDK. Um, well, an SDK that did the exact same thing this did and put it on a private NuGet feed, or you could put something in your directly .build up props that set all these things. Um, but that's something that you have to be knowledgeable, knowledgeable about to set up. And then it's something you have to maintain as you go forwards to newer versions. You have to go and update those, those centralized settings that you've, that you've built for yourself. Um, and this is basically about packaging those up into something that's usable by everyone so they don't have to understand the details like just give me the settings that a console app should have give me the settings that a web app sh should have um you could also look at it as as um like the these archetypes are essentially the contents of the template files um to it, it, well it it is essentially if you look at a template file like um you can look at some of that as boilerplate essentially it's stuff you're never going you're never going to touch um and so this moves that into something where you don't have to care about it um and, to, and unless you ever get to a point where you do need to change it but until you do you don't have to see it you don't have to understand it you don't have to t touch it it gets all packaged up into I understand that my project is getting everything it needs to be a console app, getting everything it needs to be a web app. I don't need to understand all the little details that that involves. And that's true even today with the defaults. Like Developers don't understand all of the little details of what happens in the build targets. Um, so, so a follow-on question then there. So we ship these, or we would make console nine, console 10, mm -hmm. console 11, ASP.NET 9, 10, 11, right? These sort of named recognized archetypes. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm an org and I have my own set of standards, will we be able to define our own archetypes? Is there thinking mm -hmm. there? That's a couple of questions in chat. So like Phil and Andy Walter had questions in that sort of space. Yeah, that's a, that is an excellent, question. That is something we have been thinking about. Um, it is something that, that might not make the cut for V1 and would happen later down the line. Um, but it's, def it's definitely something we're thinking about. It, it, de it definitely makes sense for orgs. Um, and that's something that the it inheritance enables in that you could have, you know, my org archetype um, inherits from .NET 9.0. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, the exact mechanism like the exact me mechanism by which you would share those ar those archetypes within your org um, isn't something that we have fully fleshed out um, at this at this point in time. But it is something we're thinking about, and kind of related to that is the idea that you could have a uh, um, so you have your org level diff. De definition of archetypes that you might want to share on NuGet on a private NuGet feed, um, but also your repo level archetypes. Like, what happens if I want to redefine what a console app is within the scope of my repo? What if I want to re redefine what a .NET um, pro project is within the scope of my repo? Um, so, mechanisms that would let you re redefine or define new oh, new like re redefine existing archetypes or define new archetypes at the root of your repo for use with by all the projects within your repo um, and that is something we're thinking about uh, but is not fully fleshed out at this point so I definitely um, any ideas folks have have on that I would definitely um, I would definitely welcome. Yeah. Cool. Um, we're mostly through a lot of the key comments and, and feedback from the demo that you've shown so far. 
Um, there's an interesting thought here, some feedback on the migration itself. It might be nice to know that, you know, when this is reverted, what will it go to? But um, that that seems like a thing that we can figure out the, the correct experience of, right? I think it's important to note that what we're seeing in front of us right now is a prototype. It's the core of the idea, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think that that specifically is something that we may be able to address with a better MS Build tooling experience in general. Like I would love to be able to hover over one of these properties and see what the value of this property was before it was reassigned. Um, so not just so you, you know that's not something that is just specific to archetypes. It's it's true of your .NET projects in general today. It's kind of difficult to reason about the value of of of, of these things in your project file without the assistance of tooling. I I really like that idea. In my mind, what it seems like is if I remove this line of code, what will happen? Yes. And I think that's a really important thing for us to think about. We happen to have some booleans in here, which you can guess well, true, false. But as somebody earlier said, uh, nullable is actually enable, disable, because there is a warning level on that that is, mm -hmm. or an annotations level, which is quite infor important for down level uh, projects. I like that idea. Mm -hmm. What else do we have, Chet? We're going to be going over by a few more minutes, but we're going to quit in just a few minutes because we are definitely over. But I want to get a couple more things here. Um, so there's just a couple things um, around, like, how will this affect F-sharp projects? And how can I discover this magic that just happened? I think the second one we briefly touched on a little bit earlier when Michaela was digging into the way that the props files are generated. But I don't think we've discussed, like, the scope of what projects or what languages or whatnot would be able to play in this world. Yeah, this this should just work for F Sharp and VB.net. Um, yeah. There there is nothing C Sharp specific about it, really. Um, it it's yeah for things like nullable and implicit usings, and we probably would want those things in the archetype to actually be conditioned on the language being C Sharp, yeah. uh, and so there would be a little bit of work to make sure. That we did fully support all of the all of the languages, yeah. um, and that is something that has come up in our discussions. Like, do we want to have to have a standard mechanism for having um, my archetype, my like the .NET archetype could have an archetype dot props, an archetype dot C sharp dot props, an archetype dot VB dot props, and, and so on, and then the generated SDK dot props would conditionally import those based on the language of your your project. Because yes, yeah, some of the things we've been talking about have been C sharp specific, but there's no reason for the mechanism to be C sharp specific at and, all. And I think that's one thing we've sort of missed talking about, Michaela, which is we are showing a very early prototype because you the people who are here, we appreciate so much your feedback. And we kind of should have led with this. This is a very early preview of something that we certainly hope to ship. We are excited about it, um, but we don't have a schedule for this. And it is really just showing it for, and we've gotten good feedback. Thank you uh, to all the folks who've been commenting. Um, this is to show a very early version uh, of this uh, particular thing. We don't know if it'll be in .NET 9. Um, we, we hope it will be in, in at some point we're thinking about the problem space, right? And we see a pattern emerging after the past few releases. And so we're thinking about it now to tackle it before it becomes a, a huge problem. Yeah, we, we don't like it getting bigger at all. And we definitely stood back on the central project management and the, um, uh, the artifacts output directory that I never can remember the name of. Uh, so I need Michaela's tool, uh, so I don't have to remember it, uh, yeah. but yeah, the. Uh, and, and we also, you know, C-sharp, I feel pretty good about the direction we're going with C-sharp simplification. Collection uh, initializers were absolutely fantastic. I think a lot of people know we're looking into dictionary initializers. We've got some other things going on with the .NET, uh, the .NET BCL, the uh, core languages themselves, some, some things about async. We've got a bunch of stuff going on. So that kind of feels on track, but we've kind of not been giving a lot of simplification 
effort to your overall experience, which definitely includes the project and solution files. Okay. So that's kind of that's why that's getting a little bit of love right now. Yeah, we're looking at the at the full end to end, the broad scope mm -hmm. of the entire .NET dev development experience, and that is kind of what my role is as an architect, uh, um, and specifically an architect on on the .NET tools team, looking at how tooling can make this better. Um, Yep, we want to make experiences that developers love. And yeah. speaking of experiences that developers love. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's great to hear that. I even wrote myself a note to install it. I didn't know that one existed. <laughs> no, we want to install it for sure. It, it's, uh, we definitely want feedback on that as well. Uh, so yes. uh, definitely Please. both feedback of problems and whether you think that we should go forward and get it as a full part of Visual Studio. We could use some some hearts on that, some some uh, some people. If you love it, please tell us that you want it. So yeah. Yes, please, please, please fill out the survey that is linked in the blog post on the VS blog where we where we announced that experiment. It uh, it's something where you know as PMs, our role is to gather evidence that there is a need for something and that people want something um, and that if we build it, they will use it. And so any, any evidence that people could provide us that this is something that they want and something that they will use and is important to them would be super helpful for us to justify um, spending engine, engineering resources on that. Like, you, you know, like we don't have infinite engineers, everything we build comes at the expense of something else that we could have built. So what makes this more important than the other things that we could do with with those resources? Um, yeah, so if, if folks like this, please, please, please give us concrete evidence. Yeah. You mean like this? <laughs> <laughs> that is great, yes. I, I, will be, I will be screenshotting these. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are two more things I think in yeah. chat before uh, we'll hand it back to Bill to, to you know sing us off the stage. Um, the first is let, let's go challenging, not so challenging, I think, or other way around. This I think is the easy one. I could say this is easy. Yeah, this one's easy. No. no, it is not being discontinued. Yes, it will continue. We have a very, 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 very Many varies. Add as many as you want. Long support policy on this is ships in Windows. And so if you understand our support, then that means that it's there. I don't know. The, the heat death of the universe. I mean, it's going to be there for a while. I, not the heat death of the universe. It won't be here that long. But uh, it, it's... It, Until the sun yeah. goes Nova. Yeah. That said, that said, if you do want the latest and greatest features and performance, then, dot, then yeah. newer versions of .NET, .NET 8 is the place to be. And we have been investing in building tooling to help people get there. So we now have yeah, the absolutely. .NET uh, upgrade assistant that you can mm -hmm. use that will actually perform some of the some of the work required to move forwards. It's not going to help with everything. Um, it's not a simple mechanical transformation that we can apply to all projects. Um, but we would definitely encourage people where possible to, yeah. to move to the newer versions. But it's not, go, it's not going away. It's not getting unsupported. It is something we will be maintaining and supporting in our tooling um, going forwards. And I will say, if you are on a team or an org that is looking at making the framework to modern .NET transition, and you are worried about repeated cost of, of yearly releases, in general, you don't have to be. We get feedback again and again and again that the yearly updates are, you know, a couple days of dev time, a week of dev time. We spent more time validating than we did upgrading. This is the feedback we hear all the time. And part of the reason why that's the case is because we're working really hard to keep compatibility in the tooling yeah. and the stack, right? So. Yeah. And we pick up 15 to, we've got uh, this company called Engine, e -D -E -N -D -J -I -N. They have a great blog and they keep up with our performance. They pick up a 15 to 20% uh, upgrade by changing the TFM. And for their project, that's all they're doing is changing the TFM and getting a free 15 to 20% over each of the last three releases while they've been tracking. 
Okay. So yeah, it's uh, and it's a big project. So. Right. Speaking of future enhancements or investments, Kathleen, mm -hmm. this is one for you. Will we have a stream about DU's unions and the current state of it? I'm assuming this is in C sharp. Yes, we will. I, I even if it's even if it's the, we're crying because we we we've, we've run into a wall. We're going to share. We absolutely understand that this is one of the top asks. We understand why. I am an F sharp programmer too. I love to use. And all I can say is that when I see something in C sharp that's just too ugly, I'm I'm gonna call it out. And we need to do it in a way in C sharp that feels like C sharp is not ugly and isn't gonna hurt your performance. Because when we do these new features that make your life easier, we can't be undermining the performance work while we do that because we know you also want your application to go very fast. So all those things coming together, it's, it is a hard problem. We are working on it. We have made a lot of problems, uh, problems, progress. We made a lot of progress on ideas around the implementation. Uh, and we're turning back now to the uh, to some of the, the semantics and syntax and behavior, but Bill and I are both involved in an effort on that. So yes, we will talk about it. We can't wait. All right. That closes us out on the comments. I think so. This was awesome. Um, I'm still going to just throw my one question in there is I, I love the way this is going with trying to like totally make it so maybe I don't even need a project file. Mm -hmm. And I know there's language proposals here too, but one day I still want to write hash bang slash slash user local bin dot net and then C sharp <laughs> code and just let it run. But uh, yep. I do actually have a prototype that lets you do that. <laughs> <laughs> this is this this is all this is all stuff we have been playing around with um yeah it's uh it's it's feedback we've been hearing and we do want to to yeah we do want to do this it's just yeah it's uh, it? it's a it's a lot of work to make sure we do it right and to and it's it, it's a lot of potential impact on the ecosystem um mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that this one, like running loose files or not requiring a project mm -hmm. file, is not necessarily a technical problem, but it's like a tools ecosystem integration problem? Like you want to make sure the syntax for package references works nicely, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, part of that. So I have this other proposal that, that, that has been part of this simplification work called implicit project files, which is basically the idea of if you have a project file that, that doesn't contain anything you put there yourself, um, why do you even need it? So have, have a pattern by which we can determine from the file layout, I have a project here, even though I don't have a project file. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would enable you to do .NET run on a directory, .NET run on a file. And then if we allow the, um, if if we if we have the C sharp compiler, then ignore the shebang. If it's if it's the first line of the file, then that just works. Um, but the reason um, we've been looking at that specific way of doing it is because we don't want to create a a a bifurcation in the ecosystem. We don't want it to be so. If you're using um, if you're if you're not using pro project files, you have one way of doing things, and if you are using project files, you have a completely different way of doing things. And like, if you're not using product files, there will always be things where when you, you will reach a point, well, you may not, but some people will reach a point where they will grow beyond what is possible within that scope. They'll need to set an MS build property. They'll need to write a custom target or, or whatever. And at that point, they will need a project file. And so making it so that, that transition is as smooth as possible. Like they're not faced with a huge big file that contains a bunch of stuff that is irrelevant. That only Their file only contains the thing that they actually needed to add a file for in the first place. Um, and secondly, and that's how we, that's, um, and and uh, yeah, we hear about people asking for the, uh, for the uh, hash R sy syntax for, re for package references. And that's a very difficult one because making it actually work in a performant way in the build system for files that do use project files is actually very difficult because you, you you then end up with a very expensive multi-stage build where you have to first of all go and gather all of the C sharp files and then scan them all for the hash R's 
and then go right back to NuGet Restore at the beginning of the build process, run your NuGet Restore, and then you even get technically a re-entrancy issue in that your NuGet packages might add more C-sharp files in. So now you need to go and scan all of those C-sharp files as well, unless we had some kind of special case saying that files from NuGet packages don't get to do hash hours. Um, but it's a non-trivial issue making sure that if we allow hash hour in, fi in files without project files, we also allow them in when you do have pro product files. So we're not creating these two completely different ways of doing things and making it more of a um, more of a cliff um, between those two yeah. worlds. So ideally, we just want a continuum, not two distinct worlds with a barrier between them. And that, that's also all just to add on to that. That that's one of the things when we're composing learning materials. One of the biggest things we try never to do is go, I know what I taught you before. <laughs> now you have to forget that and learn something new because mm -hmm. now we're doing this different. It, it really is a huge barrier for people learning things. And I just want to say, we spent a lot of time on, on, on parts of this, but we really are all over the place. Chet's been doing some work to make containers easier. Uh, Bill keeps up with the docs. We've been doing a lot of stuff around everyday C sharp, trying to make uh, life easier. We really are thinking very broadly on this and we would love your ideas. So mm -hmm. I'll add that, but we're also really, we're way over. We're 20 minutes over. So I think we're going to have to call it. What do you think, Bill? I think so. And with that, I will say thank you so much to everyone. And I really appreciate everything we learned today, Michaela. That was awesome. And uh, we will see you again on the next uh, Managed Runtime and Stand Up. Thanks. Yep.